Well, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, it's great to see so many people signing up for our first webinar of 2023. I hope you all had a good break over Christmas. Uh, today's webinar is all about improving operational efficiencies and reducing environmental impacts at Zoos Victoria uh, with a real focus on water, carbon, waste and energy. So we're hoping to do more of this sort of theme this year where we're actually providing examples where there's been a true concerted effort to achieve that. And I think uh, Zoos Victoria is one of those examples. So our presenter today is Kiam Jung, who's Senior Manager of Environmental Sustainability at Zoos Victoria, and myself, Richard Campbell, the Managing Director at Hydroterra. All right, and there we are. A little bit about Kiam. So Kiam's first professional work took him to Southeast Asia as a civil engineer where he witnessed widespread devastation of the natural environment. His passion for the environment led him to pursue a master's degree in cleaner production. After some years working as a consultant, he joined Sustainability Victoria in 2005 in the business team and in 2008, he joined Zoos Victoria as their senior manager for environmental sustainability. His key role involves reducing Zoos Victoria's environmental footprint by developing an environmental sustainability strategy and supporting programs such as carbon neutrality, environmental management systems, resource efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable procurement. In 2013, Kiam was instrumental in getting carbon neutral certification for Zoos Victoria, making this a world first for a zoo organization. So I think you can tell from uh, that description that we're very lucky to have an expert here uh, in terms of dealing with a whole range of challenges that businesses face uh, in becoming more sustainable. Before we charge into Kiam's presentation, just a few things. We love your questions. And the way you can raise a question on these webinars is to use the Q&A button at the top of your screen and uh, just put your question in there. I will read those questions out at the end of the presentation. Why does Hydroterra undertake these webinars? Well, we really do believe that we need to share knowledge and uh, we're lucky to work in with companies such as uh, Zoos Victoria who have some real wisdom to share. Uh, we also like to get involved in facilitating education and you'll see in some of uh, Kiam's slides that the zoo also is proactive in this area in terms of training. Um, and we like to have an industry leadership position in terms of trying to get people adopting practices that are going to improve operational efficiencies. About today's webinar, topic one is from Kiam and it's about improving operational efficiencies and reducing environmental impacts at Zoos Victoria. Topic two is just a case study from myself that we did with Zoos Victoria that focused on water monitoring and management component of that. And the final component, part three, is the Q&A section. So without further ado, I would like to pass over to Kiam. Many thanks, Kiam, for joining us today. And uh, let yep. you take it from here. Fantastic, yep. Thank you, Richard. Uh, for the fantastic introduction. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so today, um, I'm just going to talk about like a bit about our stance on climate change, uh, a bit about carbon neutrality, 
about our environmental management as well. I mean, everything here that I'm going to talk about is actually part parcel of the EMS. So the environmental management system steers everything. So when I'm talking about things, program policies and things like that, it comes from the environmental management system. All right. So that's the thing that underpins everything. Um, I won't go into detail about the EMS per se, but uh, the programs, as you see, comes from stems from there. Uh, I'll talk about carbon neutral, um, a bit about net zero, and the difference between the two, resource uh, monitoring, how we actually measure our resource, because everything we do is actually backed by evidence. We have a very evidence-based organization, so everything needs to be backed up. Um, our renewable energy program, uh, our waste program as well, water efficiency. Uh, I'll talk about carbon offsets as well for those who are interested, because I think this is really important, controversial uh, at this stage. Some people are opposed to carbon offsets, uh, we are not. Um, so I'll talk about it a little bit uh, and a bit about staff training and awareness, because that's like the the engine of the works, you know, I mean, without that, um, things will fall apart quite easily. And also some priority projects and next steps for Zeus Victoria. Right, next slide, please. So for those who don't know, um, Zeus Victoria is a state government entity. Uh, we are a world leading zoo based uh, conservation organization dedicated to fighting extinction. So our main purpose is actually fighting extinction. Our front is actually the zoo. Uh, back of house, we do a lot of conservation work um, and we, we, ex we exist for that kind of thing. Our primary purpose is actually that. So we are front-facing. We've got uh, four zoos now. Um, Hillsville uh, is an Australiana zoo. Melbourne Zoo is a, a traditional city zoo, the oldest zoo in Australia. And Werribee Open Vein Zoo is a, like, um, like an African-type zoo. Uh, and Kyabram is a... It's a um, it's a new acquisition for us in Kyabram. So somewhere in between near Ichuka, I think it is. Yeah, so it's a country zoo as such. Next slide, please. So this is our, uh, um, well, our climate change position statement. Um, and I wouldn't read everything, but it talks about, you know, our wildlife, the effects of wildlife on climate change, uh, habitat, people as well. Um, talk a little bit about SDGs, the importance of SDGs, uh, emissions and, and energy, which is all what I'll focus on today. And, and really for us as a zoo, if we do not take care of the environment, like um, you will see for us as a conservation organization, you see the impacts of climate change on animals that we care for. So as an organization, we should be caring for environment ourselves and making sure that our emissions are at its lowest possible in the way we operate. And that's why carbon neutrality is so important for us. All right, next slide, please. Um, and also, this is actually a very good slide that I always like to tell this. The short story about a few things. Um, if you look at those, that picture, there's a few animals that are actually in our care currently. Um, some are affected by, you know, like, extreme weather conditions like the fire, floods and things like that, that come to our care as a consequence of climate change and other factors as well. Some of them are long-term climate change events that affect their habitat. Uh, things like the mountain picnic possum, uh, they used to live up in the alpine regions of um, Victoria. Um, and and it's getting, as you can imagine with, with global warming and the warming of our, 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 even our, our own landscape here, you see more um, or infrequent events of, let's say, heavy snowfall and things like that, which means that their habitat um, is, is going to change. Um, and also their, their food source is going to change as well because of the climatic change as well. So when they wake up, for instance, and they're looking for this bogum moth to eat, uh, they may not be there you know, at the time they, where they wake up because they're, or they're only uh, hibernating marsupial in Australia. And things like that. So we have those animals in our care, right? Um, and um, they are there, not because we want to show the public, it's because uh, the species numbers have declined significantly and they are the, a threatened species in Victoria. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is actually our policy, an extract from our policy. Uh, 
so for our EMS and for our, our management system, we started off by implementing a policy at Goose Victoria a long time ago. I think 2009 or something like that, we, we already developed a policy already. So I think the policy is really important. If you haven't got one already set up something, a policy actually steers quite a bit and it gives top level management a commitment to actually do something, okay? So we've got a board as well, the board approved the policy and from that policy, we developed programs all the way down. Um, it's changed significantly, um, uh, that policy. So basically I've highlighted a few, I've uh, bold a few of those uh, key words, things that carbon neutrality is there to stay. Um, going towards that zero emissions is another one. So while we're carbon neutral, we're still heading towards zero. Um, preventing pollution is a big one for us as well. Uh, managing our resources more efficiently. Uh, that's the resource efficiency part of the program. Reducing waste to landfill. I'll talk a few things, talk about that um, quite a bit here in this, in this presentation. Um, ESG is something that the, the, the word is, is new. But sustainable procurement has always been around uh, since, the, since day one. But we've now got a very formal process now, right? ESG procurement. And of course, alignment with the, uh, the UN SDGs. All right, next slide, please. Um, so about carbon neutral, right? So this is actually taken off from the Climate Active Certification Program, so which we uh, certified since 2013. The first, like I said, the first zoo in the world to be certified. Um, so basically under the climate active um, certification, you've got emissions, you reduce as much as you can, whatever that's remaining, you buy offsets and you claim carbon neutrality, right? Um, so, so regardless of what state you're at, even if you start reducing as a start or at the end, like this kind of stuff, or in that progress anywhere in between, you can claim carbon neutrality by buying offsets kind of thing. All right, next slide, please. And then net zero emissions came about quite recently, just the past few years. And basically, um, the, the emphasis for net zero emissions pathway is actually about reduction, not so much about offsets anymore. So basically it's about like reducing as much as possible, even setting targets like halving by 2030, right? uh, at 2050, achieve, net, achieve zero. And um, if you can't, those, those last remaining uh, emissions that you can't reduce, you buy offsets at the very end kind of thing. Um, so, so basically achieving by 2050, zero. Um, for me, uh, I, I think that if you have the opportunity to be carbon neutral, you should be, right? Um, and not wait for this. 2050 to me is a very long time from now. If you can um, support some offset program, which of course some of you are not as good, but you support really good ones, you can actually make a difference in terms of like um, uh, 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 environmental and social outcomes as well from those offsets, which I'll talk about some of the offsets that we've chosen. So what I'm saying is that, you know, there are, people who will say against uh, carbon neutrality and just say that go, just go net zero. I say go for carbon neutrality while you're going for net zero emissions, okay? Uh, they complement each other. They shouldn't be fighting each other, they say, I would say, <laughs> yeah. All right, next one, please. Uh, so I'll go through some of the nitty gritties of our programs. Um, next slide. Um, and before I go into that, I just want to point out a couple of like high level programs and, and achievements that, that we've got, just to give you an idea of where we stand in terms of the world platform and also about where we develop some of our key policies. So like I said, we started um, developing that policy and strategy in 2008. Um, and also we led the, e the, the ZAR, is a, the Zoos uh, and Aquariums Association of Australia, so basically, I became the convener uh, for the Environmental Sustainability Specialist in, um, Scientific Advisory Group uh, in 2010. So basically, to lead um, all the other zoos uh, towards sustainability as well. And in that regard, I, I'm also a co-author for WAZA, the World Zoos and Aquarium Association, for some um, articles such as uh, 
the, the carbon neutrality or uh, climate um, paper, and also the single use plastics paper as well, or guide, they call it guide. Um, we, we started off like a, a formal skill up green training. Uh, basically, we want to bring all staff on board um, because it's, uh, sustainability, while we have a lot of passionate staff, we want to make sure that they are up to speed in terms of sustainability and all the terminology for the EMS and things like that. And so in, in July 2012, we got certified ISO 14001. That led to a series of things, you know. I mean, so formalizing that, making sure that everybody has a role and responsibility, making sure that everything is, is formalized with procedures and things like that, kind of kickstart a lot of programs as well along the way. Okay, so everybody now be, has some kind of responsibility now. It's just not me, uh, it's everybody's responsibility. And if you look at the top part there, you know, the COP18 is there. And then in 2013, we, we became a, a, a certified carbon neutral. Uh, we started having like ESG guidelines. We put up a prospectus, which is actually like a plan in 2014. Um, a plan because we've, we've got so much ambition uh, and we've got so little money. Uh, we actually wanted to find partners that will bring, we could bring along to that journey uh, to develop other projects. You know, it could be you know, renewable energy projects or anything, you know, I mean, yeah. so we actually developed this practice. We kickstart a number of other projects as well. Some of them are pretty big. Uh, COP21 to 2015, we started this zero waste landfill strategy in 2017. We developed a single use plastics policy and some people might be wondering why is there a separate policy? Uh, and that's because the senior executive team wants something more tangible because single use plastics, as you can imagine, um, is, is, has got a high environmental impact and affects a lot of animals, especially aquatic animals. Uh, so that's why we developed a, a separate policy. Um, we, we put out a, a, a separate, a, another updated version of the prospectus. We started the ESG procurement uh, formally in 2021, uh, and that's where we are at now. Uh, next slide, please. And the bottom one is um, some of the projects, you know, tangible, like, projects that we've done. Uh, at the bottom, starting 2008, one of the first things that we did was um, things like resource efficiency uh, is the first thing, low hanging fruits, right? So the thing that we come up, so in, in, in efficient equipment was changed. So like, you know, like palm, inefficient pumps, where we can, we put um, heat pump, hot water systems where there's, you know, electric, the old traditional electrical uh, hot water systems are replaced by that. Um, uh, back then, even I remember we had funding for like T5 fluorescent lamps. Of course, now it's all LEDs these days, right? But even I had to find funding for those sort of things. So basically those things kickstart the environmental program as it goes went along. And then we started looking at solar PVs and solar PVs dominated the, the sustainability program. Uh, there's some waste uh, programs along the way and water efficiency programs along the way as well as we went along. But I think this, the renewable energy program is the one that um, is the hero for carbon reduction. Uh, whereas the others, because like water efficiency that doesn't have a huge carbon impact, it's more about water saving. Okay. All right. Next slide, please. Um, the EMS. Uh, protects natural assets. For those who don't know, right, we, we actually, and you come to the zoo as well, you probably don't know that somewhere at the back there somewhere, uh, we have some natural places uh, that we take care of. And this is one of them. Uh, this is my one of my favorite spots. Uh, it's in Badger Creek, Kilsu Sanctuary. So behind a Kilsu Sanctuary, which you don't see, is, is this. Um, and so for us, the EMS protects this sort of places that you don't see as well. So we've got procedures and things like that to make sure that, you know, when contractors come in place, they, they use the, the most sustainable solutions for us, uh, do not pollute when they're on site and things like that. And we ourselves in our operations use the least polluting thing possible. I'll give an example, right? You think about horticulture. I mean, this part, of course, you can't do it, but Melbourne Zoo, we even buy bucks to fight against other bugs, you know I mean? Like, you know, insects eat other insects kind of stuff. We buy them as well. Uh, it's funny, and you see them in our books, yeah. 
Um, all right, next slide, please. And uh, these are the other pictures of the other assets. So that's actually a lake in Hillsville, of course, Barrowby River cuts across there. And now in Kyabram, there's a beautiful wetlands. Um, there's some magpie geese as well, which you commonly don't see in the wetlands, which is pretty amazing. Next slide, please. All right, carbon neutrality. Now, this one is really interesting, though. Um, um, if you think about where we started in, so basically our base year is 2011 and 12, because we were certified in 2013, but we back calculate. Um, and, and when you first look at this chart, you might think, ah, oh, they haven't done much for the last few years kind of stuff, like two, four, six, eight, nine, nine years. For so the last nine years after certification, nothing has been done, but actually there's enormous amount of work that's been done um, for the program, but it's just that you just don't see it because the zoo has actually changed when we first started the program. Uh, we see a lot more visitors now than we did in the past. We've got a lot more staff as well, right? We use a lot more resources as well, but we actually managed to curb our emissions. Okay, if we didn't have this old program, the emissions would rise. Um, I would say probably about 20 30 percent. Uh, uh, rise. I've got figures which I've calculated in the past, but I it's not in the slide here. Uh, but because of the all the programs we've got is curbed emissions, and then with some big projects such as our composting on site, a renewable energy project that has actually reduced our emission by the thousands kind of stuff. And now we are actually around about the four thousand tons now. So about fourteen thousand tons we start off with. Now we are about four thousand tons. So it's about 70% reduction now. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Oh, something um, wrong. Oh, oh, jumped. <laughs> um, all right, so in terms of like the inventory itself, like if you see the pie of where the, the emissions come from. Um, those that are taken out have now been neutralized already or reduced already. So basically like green power um, it is 30, 36%. We've got an off-site wind farm that produces power for um, Hillsville Sanctuary. We've got a big uh, on-site solar as well. That's 5%. Uh, waste composting is a big one that we do. Um, that's that's uh, in the program. Now there are others as well that are not in the pie, you know, because that's prior to our certification. So a lot of them are like, you know, changing over pumps, lighting and things like that. They are not in this pie, but that has been removed long, long before the certification kind of stuff. So we're left with um, things like animal food, uh, which will be hard, hard to reduce, gas we can. Uh, so future projects will be um, decarbonizing, use, you know, changing over gas appliances to electrical appliances and things like that. Uh, employee travel, we can't change much, maybe a little bit through, you know, like carpooling and things like that. But transport, we can probably a little bit. Uh, we are thinking of like electrifying some of our buses at Werribee and things like that. So there are a few things we can reduce, uh, but we'll probably be left with another probably about 20% at the very end, I would say. Okay. Okay, next slide, please. Now, um, I'm showing you this slide because, you know, um, this normally I don't show slides like this in my normal presentations I give, but this one is a bit more technical. I thought maybe I'll chuck in a couple of things. Being an engineer, I love this sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so monitoring has been like the backbone at the back of, the things that you see, the things that I normally talk about. Uh, I normally don't show these kind of slides because normally if you're not that sort of inclined, you probably don't even bother looking at it. But it is so important for us, right? Everything, like I say, is evidence-based. Uh, I remember even doing a, uh, a, a carbon cost, uh, marginal carbon cost reduction curve or something. I can't remember what the term is back then. Uh, that looks at different technologies and their respective benefits in terms of like, let's say offsetting, right? And whatever that's on the offsetting line and below, we will do kind of stuff. Uh, 
Um, so above, we will try to find funding, but if not, everything that's below that, that offsetting line, we will do kind of stuff. So that's why a lot of projects will kickstart and a lot of efficiency programs will, will realize in that sense. And to get them realized, we need to do some measurements. Now, this is pretty new for us. It's been just for the past few years. It hasn't been long. But prior to this, we used to go around measuring by hand, right? looking at things, looking at you know, the back of the machine to find out what the consumption is, um, taking some assumptions of their usage, putting on like you know, those power meters, uh, portable ones where we can to measure them overnight or the week or whatever, and getting a picture of the whole zoo. In fact, all three zoos, I've got a whole list of Excel spreadsheets and spreadsheets of all this sort of stuff every equipment I can measure. Um, and from there, we make decisions on where to reduce and things like that. Now, this is like the, the Rolls Royce for us. This is actually about more automating measurements. So putting in meters. So you can see three zoos here because we haven't measured um, Kyabram yet. Um, so basically we need to add Kyabram and add a few more meters here and there. But this gives us um, real time uh, data on what's being consumed, I mean, how much energy is being consumed at, at each zoo, the incoming, all the incoming meters, and also the first level consumption as well. So basically the distribution from the incoming, right? So we can see like the, the bottom there, it says the Werribee restaurant D before, it, that goes, shows you the line for, that's going into the restaurant, right? Uh, and the other picture on the right shows you um, for each line that we're measuring, it gives you the, the phases of the electricity that's used, the power quality as well, the power factor and things like that as well. We can, we can measure and we can see the power quality of the line, that electricity that's going in as well. Right? So we can pick problems that, are, that could be happening. Let's say a power factor uh, correction needs to be done because you know some other equipment is disturbing the power and things like that. So we could have then uh, in the future a better picture of what's going on. All right. Um, next slide, please. And we also have another set of tools. This is our our roving set of meters. So basically, it's a it's a set of CTs that we clamp on um, electrical lines. So basically, we've got this set where, you know, after this first line, and if we see unusual consumption or high consumption, we could actually use this, right, to clamp on things uh, and then measure it for a specific number of time and then plot out the energy flow. So with this energy flow, we can then work out like, you know, like for this, you know that, you know, the DB1 or whatever, it's high consumption. So, so if, if it was me or anybody, uh, or electrical person, they will actually then focus on that because the opportunities could be in that, you know, in that area. So you want to focus on that and, and detect and see what's going on, where the high, high consuming equipments are, uh, work out, are they working at the optimum rate? Is there something wrong? Is the bearings, you know, uh, uh, rotten, you need to change and things like that. You might get a heat gun to go and measure and see where, you know, heat is escaping and things like that to work out stuff, yeah. Right, for efficiency. All right, next slide, please. And we also generate heat maps in the site. And this heat map is actually generated by actually walking around doing a bar, uh, like energy audits and things like that, working out what sort of equipment's there, how much they're consuming. And that gives us a picture about where we should be focusing as well. All right, next slide, please. And from there, I just picked out an, uh, and uh, let's say a sector five and sector five, we can actually then look and see diff different types of consumption in, in a more granular level uh, and how much you're being consumed and what proportion as well. Okay, next slide, please. And then I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples of some of the initiatives that has come out from this. And, and the first one of course is our renewable energy uh, program. I would say that, like I said, the hero of the um, uh, carbon reduction the most. Uh, so where we can, um, we have actually gone, come to a stage where we've filled up all our roof spaces already for bigger installations. 
you can probably put a small ones, you know, three, four kilowatt type ones around the place under 10. Uh, but all the big ones have been absorbed through all the rooftops already. When you come to the zoo, you can't see them, but they are, trust me, they're up there somewhere. Um, so we've got around about 674 kilowatts of on-site solar PV. Some might think it's not, it's not terribly big, I would say, but that's all the roof spaces we've got, you know, because we've got animal exhibits and things like that. Our buildings are not the features of our zoos. Um, the meal picture is, is the one, um, we've got about 55 kilowatt in our corporate office. That's the, probably the biggest single installation we've got. Uh, um, and you see the Melbourne skyline. My favorite, of course, is the solar forest uh, on the right at Werribee. As you come into Werribee, you'll see that. Um, it doesn't produce, it, it, and while it's one of my favorites, it, it's actually one of the, uh, the worst in terms of like return on investment. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's one of our showcase ones. Um, it's an off-grid system. It's made from uh, recycled uh, timber. So basically, we've got uh, three types of um, renewable energy projects. One, of course, of our on-site solar. Uh, the other second one is uh, a power purchase agreement for a wind farm. Um, and the third one is actually just green power from the grid. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, is that the next one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So coming to our zero waste landfill program, um, that's the next biggest uh, carbon emissions area. Um, we, as you can imagine, we are a, a zoo, so we produce a lot of organic waste from our animals, from our horticulture, from, you know, from our parks and things like that. Our food as well that we produce, um, for visitors and for our own uh, staff kitchens or animal kitchens as well. So we actually used to dump them to landfill um, because there's no solutions in the city area. Um, so it, it became unsustainable. We know the greenhouse gas emissions are high. So one of the big projects we implemented is this in-vessel composter. Um, so the in-vessel composter, um, compost round about two tons, two, two over tons of uh, organic waste per day. Uh, and um, this has been like a, a savior for us. And other than that, we recycle a lot of other things as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is our single use plastics um, policy. Um, Part and parcel of zero waste to landfill, like I said before, the single use plastics policy is something that's really important for us. Uh, the picture that you see is actually our uh, um, post mix solution. So basically, we ban um, plastic bottles, amongst other things as well. Um, so I'm just highlighting the, the bottles, but um, it, that, that has changed the way we look at single use plastics at our zoo. So basically things like, I mean, this is so important, right? For those who uh, wear like, you know, everything, like single use plastics, as you can imagine, right? You might not think about it, whatever that ends up as litter and things like that ends up in the ocean. And then aquatic animals, especially mistake them for food. Uh, those that are not consumed, of course, uh, break down and become microplastics that you see. Uh, well, not you see, I mean, you can't see them, but uh, it, as you can, you, you see in terms of like people getting um, in the bloodstream, fish eating them and things like that, and we, we consume it. So it becomes part and parcel of the food chain. Okay. So that's something that's not good for anyone. Uh, so for, for, because of that, we developed this policy and the World Zoo Aquarium Association as well has put a stand on the single use plastics as well. So basically all the other zoos are following suit, uh, implementing something like what we've implemented. So this, this initiative that you see here, the single use plastics has reduced around about 600,000 um, uh, plastic bottles or about 12 tons of plastics per year, which is amazing. And, and our contractor um, uh, for, for this, um, soft drinks right, have actually made a tremendous effort in implementing such a program. It's almost like a trial to them. 
Um, so they can be implemented elsewhere. So you get all sorts of flavors and things like that when you come to the zoo. Um, we're still working on the best solution for um, the cups. Um, we're looking at things like souvenir cups and things like that that can be reused. Uh, but in the meantime, it's, it's like compostable cups. So after drinking um, from the cup, you chuck the cup into a compost bin and then from there, it goes to our composter. So basically, whatever that what you finish eating or drinking with goes to the back of house, gets composted, so that you don't have the emissions that comes from there. Okay. Um, water efficiency. Uh, this one here, if you think about the zoo, we use a lot of water in order to maintain the gardens and things like that. There's a lot of water used. So this, we've got a water treatment plant at the back of Melbourne Zoo that produce like a tremendous amount of water, around about close to 100 megalitres of water per year, right? Um, when, I first, when we first got the plant, it was meant to be just environment, for the environmental protection, which is good, right? But we actually turn it a little bit and change the way we operate and make it more efficient uh, by producing more uh, so that we can reduce uh, our dependence on portable water. So reducing the cost as well and also the energy use as well through a number of things like you know, having wetlands, uh, backwashing with recycled water so you don't have to use the osmosis systems and things like that. All right, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this one is just a reticulation of, of, of the zoo uh, in terms of where we go. So basically, this is everything at the zoo now is connected some, in some form or another. So it's actually a closed system. And that closed system actually works as well as our environmental protection. So that if there's any spills, like contaminate, contamination spills, let's say chemicals, um, fuel or whatever kind of stuff, it gets captured in the system and it gets locked up into tanks and things like that. Right. Next slide, please. Um, this one here is about, you know, in the zoo, we, we, one of the highlights when coming to the zoo, it's not just the animals, it's also about the unique plants, plants that, uh, that we have. And they're managed uh, very well through a system of like a central irrigation control systems where we monitor um, things like weather, soil moisture, uh, even plant water uptake, which Richard will talk about. Right, about uh, that project that we've got. So basically it's about having knowledge and measurements to actually optimally keeping plants alive with the best um, growth uh, and health. Okay, next one, please. Um, ESG procurement is something that we are doing now in a formal sense, like I mentioned before, we used to have um, uh, sustainable procurement, but now it is a formalized uh, program. We've got finance department in there. We've got all the contracts managers in there, uh, together with sustainability people. So we we form form a team to make sure that uh, um, the people that we want to deal with is the right people, like companies and things like that. We've got the right policies in place and the right product standards as well to meet certain things that are of of significance to us. Say. Um, sustainable seafood, sustainable wood products, and things like that. All right, next slide, please. Uh, carbon offsets, I'll just give one example instead of the three because I think we're running out of time. Um, carbon offsets, some people still think that, you know, it's not something that is a good thing to do. But for us, as a conservation organization, it is imperative for us that if we're going to offset we buy offsets that protect the natural environment. And these are some of the offsets that we have chosen. Um, it's got, the, and, and we also try to pick offsets that have got biodiversity type certifications alongside with um, carbon certifications as well. And the reason being, we want to make sure that um, those areas are protected well uh, and well managed as well. Okay. And their social, as well as environmental benefits associated with those offsets. All right, next slide, please. This example, for instance, right, um, from the offsets, you know, there's employment in place, schools, you know, eco factories, and things like that. 
there are a lot of trees we planted, you know, as some of the things that we want to see is like, you know, endangered animals protected as well, elephants and things like that. All right, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I think we, we, we'll skip that one because it's very similar, but just in a different location. Uh, competency and awareness is something that um, we do a lot, right? Uh, we don't talk about it a lot, but in-house, we've got like training modules. Um, we've got currently two training modules for general staff and we're developing specific ones uh, as uncovered by the EMS. Um, we have completed like, you know, the Skill Up Green program, which is a com competency-based program. Um, so under development, there are things like, you know, resource efficiency, waste management, and so on. But having said that, we've got three green teams across our, or yeah, three green now, and we're developing one for Kyber. So we will have green teams across all our zoos. And those green teams are actually part and parcel of the way we, inform and infiltrate to all staff. So basically the, the green team members represent a department. So they're actually there for a purpose uh, to make sure that the information and the programs trickle back in their departments. They're no longer like volunteers in the past. Okay, next slide, please. So um, the current projects and priorities, um, like I said, this is a prospectus, which is like a plan. So basically it's, about like energy monitoring is a big one for us to, to uncover more, you know what I mean? So we've come to a stage where we need to dig, dig deeper uh, into where those opportunities are uh, and, and then going through a decarbonization of those other fossil fuels uh, like gas equipments and vehicles and also looking at ESG procurement because, you know, the inputs are so important. Like if you've got good inputs, then you don't have to deal with the outputs that are not so good, all right? Next slide. I think that's it for me. Excellent work, Kiyan. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Yep. Apologies, everyone, for the technical challenges we've had here today. It's good to see most people have stuck around for the presentation. Yeah. So just going to talk briefly because we've got quite a few questions um, about a project we have done at the Melbourne Zoo. Um, what it highlighted to me is some of the things that kiam has been talking about, um, particularly like the heat map representation where you really do need to break up your facilities into these management areas of meaning and, and you need to correlate them with uh, the data you have, um, which sometimes involves quite a bit of extrapolation. And this project... Um, was really about trying to measure the water use of the various um, plant assemblages that are quite diverse through the Melbourne Zoo, as you can imagine, and then have feedback from that coming in for how they set and control their irrigation system at Melbourne Zoo. Now, you're probably not aware, but Melbourne Zoo has hundreds and hundreds of sprinkler heads and hundreds and hundreds of solenoids that control those sprinkler heads and when they're turned on and off. So it is quite unusual setup in terms of being able to influence water use when you know and can monitor how much water it really needs. So this project um, was about assessing the water status of the soil and plant communities across the site and assessing the effectiveness of the irrigation activities. And this was a project managed by the zoo by Giuseppe Greco, who is a regular participant on our webinars. Many thanks, Giuseppe. Um, really, the, the big take home message um, I have about this project was, we had a limited amount of budget to measure. Um, we chose technologies which allowed us to understand plant uptake itself, as well as moisture stress in the soil using soil moisture sensors. So a few different sorts of sensors. So dendrometers for tree water use and soil moisture capacitance probes for, for the soil side of things. 
the, the, the challenge was then to how to extrapolate that across various areas of the zoo to provide meaningful information back to Giuseppe who sets all the sort of delivery through those solenoids. And we did that by breaking the site up into management areas and providing sort of representative uh, water use needs for those areas. Um, these days, with the Bureau of Meteorology data, you can move more to a forecasting approach. So it doesn't need to be uh, just based on current data, but it can also be based on forecast data to get ahead of the curve there. And that can be automated into such networks. But it's been a fantastic project and we've got data on how much, you know, 100 year plus old trees like these massive fig trees suck out of the ground at the zoo, as well as uh, how different sort of assemblages of plants need different amounts of water at different times. And the outcome of this has been significant reductions. Sorry, just checking the term for that. Significant reductions in the amount of water used. All right, so without further ado, I think we'll skip over the lessons learned and go to the questions that have been raised. So, Kiam, how can we improve transparency in carbon offsets? Yeah, um, well, I think um, that that is actually quite an interesting uh, question and something that I'll probably have to answer because we, we've got this request on, on why we're choosing offsets as well. And, and I think the, the, the problem with offsets is that there are some, of course, a bit dodgy offsets that's tainted the whole offset program, I would say. Um, for us, um, we use kind of the standards that are actually adopted and approved by the Climate Active Certification. So somewhere in Canberra, there's a department that looks after all the methodologies of carbon offsets and only accept the ones that are actually deemed to be deemed to have methodologies that are tangible, you know, like transparent, tangible, uh, uh, measurable, and all that kind of addresses leakage and things like that. So we are confident in the sense that uh, in our carbon neutral certification, we're picking um, the certificate body that looks and 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 also the government is part parcel of that, making sure that those offsets are tangible and real, right? And because of that, I think that should be fine. So if you're new to this and you're looking for offsets kind of stuff, uh, the key things is to look for the methodology um, and look for methodology that has been assessed by somebody else, a third party, somebody. Um, and also for us, looking at the core benefits as well is a big one. And, and, and making sure that you know some of the projects that uh, you're going to buy uh, do not let's say harm the environment or cause harm to the locals within that region as well i don't know whether that answered everything but uh, yeah are there a lot of different schemes that certify carbon offsets yes they are yeah there's a lot of methodologies around heaps yeah all right it seems like a challenge in itself. It, it is challenging. So I think uh, sticking to some known methodologies that has been assessed by somebody independent, I think is the key for me. Okay, thanks for that answer. Next question. What carbon neutral initiatives have been implemented at Zoos Victoria? How are they measured? What is the next phase? Yeah, I think I've answered most of them in my slides already. Um, and they, they're all measured based on, um, you know, the climate active uh, framework for carbon neutrality has a lot of measurements these days. Um, so they've got like emissions factors. So, you know, if you, if you use certain amount of whatever megajoules or whatever or something of, of some energy, uh, it equates to how much greenhouse gases kind of stuff. And, and the, the, the national greenhouse gas uh, factors have got a lot of measurement already. 
Uh, but Climate Active have their own list now and they're building on that list as well. But having said that, if you if you are really interested kind of stuff in that sense, when we first started uh, becoming carbon neutral, we actually had to do a life cycle analysis for certain things like food, for instance, because there are no emissions factors back then for those things. So the next, and the next phase is actually decarbonizing some of our fossil fuels like gas uh, and fuel. Um, next question. I'm interested in understanding and seeing how the net zero elements were included into an existing environmental management system. So um, our EMS actually looks after everything. And our EMS goes beyond just um, environmental protection. Uh, if you look at our aspects and impacts register, um, you see more than just, you know, pollution controls and things like that. So it's about consumption as well, you know, consumption of resources and things like that are included in the EMS. So that's how we integrated, you know, like carbon emissions into the, EM, into the EMS. So the EMS is not just about, you know, um, environmental protection, it's about sustainability as well. I mean, you probably, if you, if you know about EMS, you probably, and will probably get what I'm talking about, yeah. Good answer. Next question for you, Kian. Methods of carbon accounting used? So um, the methods is actually based on, the, it's actually a combination. Um, started off using the greenhouse gas protocol uh, as, the, as the basis of everything, uh, but the climate active have got their own um, standards. Of calculation, which is very similar to the greenhouse gas protocol, which is internationally accepted all over the world. Okay. okay. Uh, next question: Does Zoos Victoria aim to eventually not have to purchase carbon credits, or is it just not feasible? Uh, it's not feasible. Everybody probably have to buy credits at the very end. For um, if you go down the net zero emissions pathway, there are definitely going to be things that you will not be able to reduce um, so you'll probably have to buy offsets at the very end so we will continue buying offsets it's just that now we're reducing so much now 70 percent reduction i would i would imagine that we'll be left with about 20 percent that we'll just have to somehow or another continue buying uh, for eternity so, uh, Until, that's, yeah. an that's an interesting point right for eternity are there going to be enough carbon offsets yeah that's that's the thing yeah if everybody goes on that path that's what i've been thinking as well if everybody were to buy carbon offsets now there won't be enough uh, we have seen carbon offset prices increased as well as a result of um the the new interest in um you know like net zero emissions and carbon neutrality uh that the prices have gone up uh, significantly yeah. sometimes even double yeah we're going to have to innovate and think how we probably we... innovate <laughs> and find new ways. Um, of course, reduction is always the number one thing that you should be doing, and offsets is the secondary thing, you know. I mean, is to patch the things that you can't do. Yeah. Basically, yeah. All right, we've got 12 questions in the QA. Um, Kiyama, are you happy to go? Yep, I'm happy way? to go along. Yep. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so the first question is from Kelly Wickham. Hi, Kiam. Long Hi, time Kelly. no here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How much do you engage with your supply chain about their own carbon management strategies? Yeah, um, good question. Um, now, uh, now, I know that a lot of uh, suppliers, we've got a few, like, you know, we started with a few thousand, as can imagine, we're a zoo, all sorts of things. We are like a pure community. We don't just don't have a handful of suppliers. We have a lot of different suppliers, you know, for fencing and for all sorts of things, hardware, do animal food and things like that. So it's a wide range of suppliers as well. Um, some big, some small. And the challenge we've got is actually engaging everyone. Um, so through this new, um, the ESG um, procurement uh, process, we have actually got now a software management system that uh, requires every single one of them to actually tell us about their programs 
um, and the questions about carbon as well and things like that as well that we had to pick. Um, and I, I was surprised to find that some of them are carbon neutral as well, which is good. Uh, of course, not, not enough, but some of them are. I thought that none of them were, but <laughs> some of them are. Uh, so this is our first stage of engaging with our suppliers. And um, it's been a hard slog, I would say, because a lot of people are not ready for it. But we are going to push on and make sure that uh, we will um, prefer like-minded organizations as a start. And those that are willing to learn and, and improve, you will assist them to improve as well along that journey. It's, it's interesting just to reflect on what you've shown us today. And that's a very comprehensive list of changes you've made at the zoo. Just that's a massive commitment for yes. other organizations. I think it's a great leadership yeah. example. It, it, yeah, it is, it is hard. Yeah, it is hard for some of the suppliers to comply sometimes. Um, like, you know, if you've got a new policy in place about, let's say, not having a single-use plastic for certain things, and they, they, they're supplying things based on the American market, then you, you'll be running into trouble with that supplier uh, because we're just not big enough to influence them. Um, yeah. But and yet we want them to, to change kind of thing. So there's some challenges there which we're trying to iron up. All right, next question, Martin O'Rourke. Are offsets achieved by buying existing vegetated areas on uncleared land, buying replanted vegetated areas, or planting out new vegetation on cleared marginal land? Um, it's a mix of all the three, depending on where, which um, offset program we buy. So every year we go out for a um, request for quotes uh, for projects and we look at those projects and some of them are like, it could be a, a degraded land um, that is going to be now protected for, for natural growth. Some could be an active management uh, reforestation project. Uh, and so on. So it all depends. So I don't have a, a specific thing. Uh, it, and we evaluate every project um, differently every year. Um, we've got a, in our evaluation panel, um, an international program manager. Uh, we've we got one at, at Zoos Victoria that goes around different countries looking at different like conservation projects. So he sits on the evaluation project and, and advises us on those locations um, as well as looking at how tangible and how the methodology of the offsets and things like that. So it's a mixed mixture, yep. The key, I'm just, uh, just reflecting on an earlier comment where you said you help organisations that are like-minded and uh, want to go down this pathway. Um, yep. What exactly would you do, like say, hydroterrorism to become carbon neutral? What, What's the uh, interaction yeah. like? Well, uh, a number of ways. Um, we actually have a formal, even like a, a training program as well, like a, a program that you can actually get from us. Uh, sometimes it's free. Sometimes you, you just pay for, let's say, staff training and things mm -hmm. like that. That's one way. Um, we also um, are willing to share information as well. Um, like site visits and things like that. We've done quite, quite a few in the past. Uh, and also like, you know, uh, for people who, for suppliers that are interested in sustainability, we could actually have joint initiatives as well uh, in the past. We've done that uh, and, and so on. So it all depends on who the suppliers are, uh, what, what their intentions are and things like that. And that's a consultancy, isn't it? We have a, like a consultancy, yeah, which I run some training program in. Is it restricted well. to yeah. training or is it also sort of more hands-on preparing? Uh, it's more training kind of um, program. Um, we, we run a couple of different consultancy type programs in our corp from a corporate office. Uh, sustainability is one of them and some of them could be like you know animal uh, husbandry and things like that as well okay well it's yeah. good to know yeah we do um 
Next question. We've got a few sort of just comforting me that we got back online. Thank you for those. <laughs> <laughs> you could have told me earlier. <laughs> um, Keith Thompson is the next question. Is the organic waste composting facilities available to other urban organisations that produce a lot of organic waste? Yeah. Is um, underutilisation yeah. of facilities you've installed yeah. an issue? That that uh, that is a really good question. Though. Um, sadly, we've had to stop um, receiving waste. We used to do a lot of um, uh, and assist a lot of not-for-profit organisations, uh, people like Fair Share, uh, Reground, and things like that. Um, people who you know those organisations that um, prepare or collect, um, you know you know, like throw away or, or, you know, like day old food and things like that from restaurants and repurpose them uh, for the homeless and stuff like that. We, we used to actually collect, I mean, they, they used to come to Mamozu and deposit their organic space. Um, it's just that um, we, we find that um, because of the new legislation that come in as well and the permissions and things like that, we've actually had to stop for the time being until we get clarity from EPA. And also because we are at the point where, you know, our operations, like I say, have always increased. We are at a point where if you look at the old thresholds from SEP, right, uh, EPA SEP um, thresholds, we're actually at the threshold of those um, uh, thresholds in the sense that uh, accepting acceptable organic waste composted in a certain area without any kind of uh, licensing and things like that. So we have decided now to halt um, taking external um, organic waste uh, currently until such we um, come back to speed uh, after COVID-19, making sure that everything is running properly and things like that, and then just checking in with um, EPA as well regarding, you know, whether licensing is required or if is permissions just to the way to go and so on yeah so it's just up on the air now yeah but in the past we have taken yeah it's um it's one of those dilemmas uh where you have regulation that sort of almost conflicts with the ultimate policy objective and you know, working through those things is, is yeah yeah and and i think that when i spoke to epa about this this issue, they say that the, that the aim is not to actually deter you from doing good things. Uh, they just want to know what you're doing kind of stuff. So um, we're meeting with EPA soon um, to discuss further, uh, but then in my, my permissions pathway applications and things like that, I did mention that, you know, if allowed to, we will probably continue <laughs> uh, taking external ways, yeah. Okay, next right. question. Tina Zimmerman, how did the zoo respond to the cessation of the soft plastic collection recycling program? Uh, um, well, good question as well. Um, uh, for those who don't know, um, I think we, we probably skipped one slide during that. Uh, I saw a slide which I thought, hey, where, where is that slide kind of stuff? It's missing from my presentation. That slide shows the tree bin system, right? And the tree bin system is the one that we used to have uh, when there was soft plastics collection and we had a single-use plastics policy in place. We looked at our bin system and realized that really we could just introduce a soft plastics bin and we don't need a landfill bin anymore. Uh, so we, we actually have a tree bin system without landfill, soft plastics was recycled, but now with the, the issue of soft plastics now in Victoria, now everything can be recycled, even our clean plastics now can't be recycled anymore. So what we've done is, um, it is now going to landfill of course, uh, but we have just found another supplier um, that could possibly take some soft plastics from the back of house. So you might see more recycling coming out of the zoo rather than going to landfill. But we, we haven't acted on it contractually yet. Yeah, we're looking at the pricing and things like that. Right. Um, next question from John Flett. What happens to the compost produced when it contains plastics? 
and does the CO2 release as it's break down, as it breaks down, count, get counted? Um, there, there is no soft plastic, there's no plastic in our compost. Uh, we actually have a sorting facility um, before it goes, we sort the waste before it goes into the compost. So basically, if we're going to put anything that's mixed or could be contaminated, we go through a conveyor uh, and then the staff actually um, picking out some of the contaminants like soft plastics and things like that, that uh, some business may not, may not have done the right thing. Uh, and then we only put organics into the system. And because it's uh, an in-vessel composter, it produces very little greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, unlike uh, if you'd send it to landfill uh, in an anaerobic um, environment, it produces a lot of methane. And methane produces, I mean, it's a very high greenhouse gas. Um, it's got a high greenhouse gas factor. Right. Um, next question. I was actually just Ahmed Bashir from Canada wants to introduce himself. So hi there, Ahmed. Um, okay. Nick Lawson. Sustainability is a very important issue for young people, especially. I think some of us oldies care about it too, Nick. Have you, <laughs> have you reached out and engaged any youth groups or individuals regarding your projects? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have a very extensive um, youth program. There is something that you don't, you may not realise as well, while the zoo is a front-facing zoo and, you know, visitors buy tickets and go in, we've got a lot of educational programs. Uh, so I speak a lot in school groups as well. So when school groups come, uh, and um, it's a it, it's about learning about conservation as well as sustainability as well. Uh, so it's part and parcel of our educational programs. Good. So Toby Montgomery just wants to say thank you, Cam. So good on you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Liz Carey is uh, showing some empathy towards you. She's saying, "Seems you have a huge job." Do you have a big team of people supporting you? Yes, um, I, I started my on my oh, from my own uh, with one person that supports me, a sustainability officer, and that grew uh, to now every zoo has got a sustainability professional. Uh, so now I'm going to say every zoo means the three main zoos. Cairo hasn't got any any yet, but uh, there is. Um, one at Werribee, Hillsville, and Melbourne. Uh, they're all dedicated for sustainability. And below them, uh, there could be support officers. Like Melbourne Zoo has got a dedicated support officer for sustainability. And in that team, we've got, like I say, uh, green team uh, members. So there's probably about 10 or so for each uh, site. Uh, and those green team members are are like um, nominated by the department to represent their department in that zoo. So that's how it works these days. It's, uh, it's interesting to sort of see what the ratio of you know, staff required and professionals is to, to the size of the facility to yeah, it actually is. achieve, what is it, a 70% reduction? Yeah. I think it's an amazing effort. Um, and it's probably good for companies to sort of understand what that sort of percentage needs to be of staff. Yeah. Um, it's more business owners amusing. <laughs> um, next, uh, well, there's an anonymous attendee saying, is it just me or is Kia muted? I think it's just you. Um, Madeline Willemson. Considering Zoos Victoria's conservation impact, do you think the net gain biodiversity market could help you moving from net zero to nature positive? Hmm, not sure. Um, I think nature positive, not sure what it means, um, but I would imagine for us as a conservation organization, you, you would think that. For us, right, we, we are bound by Victoria because we're a state government organization. So the programs that we run are based on Victorian 
species and habitats and things like that. Uh, so we don't look after um, other places, even though we've got a lot how island stick insect program, but most of them are Victorian based. So to get a net like nature positive or whatever it is, it will mean that we probably have to influence a lot more than what we can do and what our jurisdictions are. But having said that, we do our very best because we've got a good representation for places or, or pig bodies such as um, the World Zoos and Aquarium Association and also the Australian um, Zoos and Aquarium Association as well. It's interesting to see where your influence can go, um, maybe even just through the training key. Um, yeah. It seems to me there's a great opportunity to do that. Um, next question, I'm just checking out time. So we've got quite a few people hanging on to your every word, Kiam. So if you've got <laughs> a few more minutes for us. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for that. So the next person is Nick Radin Kovic. Got that right. Uh, is all of the composted waste reused on site or does it go to another receivable facility or land? Do you compost the bioplastics, biopack? polylactic acids, cups, et cetera, on site, or are they sent to an industrial composting facility? No, all, all bioplastics are composted on site to start off with. Um, we, the in-vessel composter, it's such an amazing um, piece of equipment. Um, it actually composts on its own uh, through biological action, uh, raised up to a pretty high temperature. So everything breaks down very nicely. So if you put any bioplastics in there, you will not see it. Like, you know, you put like even like cutlery and things like that are bioplastics. You put it at the at very end, in 10 days time, you, you wouldn't see it anymore. It's completely broken down. Uh, so that, that's a good thing for us. So we compost everything like that. Um, after the composting process is used in a number of ways, the first priority, of course, if um, we want to use it in our own garden beds or across all our tree zoos, we will use them. So currently, there is a high demand to be used at Werribee. So we send a lot of our waste, organic waste to Werribee now. Um, in the past, uh, we have sent it to nurseries in the past. Um, and also in the past, it's sent to a bagging station as well, a bagging facility, not station and a composting facility as well, where it's a commercial operation, um, not our operations, it's just somebody else. Um, they actually um, get our compost, um, process it further because our compost goes through the, the, the machine uh, for 10 days, but to be a commercial compost, you need to go through further processes. So they take care of that and they bag them as zoo grow. So you can buy them from our nursery, from nurseries. Uh, uh, commercial nurseries um, and then we get uh, some money back from the sale of those zoo grow. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's, that's a small way to go. So that's, does, it, does it make much money for you, Kian? I know. It's not, it, it's not a heavy money maker, no. I think right. we, it's better for us to use it on site. Yeah. 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 All right, we're up to the last question. Anthony Quinn, and it's more a statement that it says, thanks, Kiyam and Richard. Um, and he wants to know if we can provide recordings. All of the webinar recordings are saved to our website. If you go onto our website and look under, I think it's the news tab, you'll find a recording of the webinar, which um, uh, will have everything you've seen today. So on that note, I'd just like to really thank you, Kiyam. I think uh, what Zoos Victoria is doing is truly inspiring and it does provide a really leading example of where we all need to head. So I would have thought the world's your oyster in terms of being able to provide that sort of advisory service that you're referring to in terms of yeah. training. So many thanks for participating today and many thanks also to the technical support team here at Hydroterra. We've had to scramble a bit due to my laptop. Um, so thanks to you too, Gleedson and Gordon. Um, so thank you, Kia. Yep, um, thank you very much. Yeah, for those who are, who are still around, yeah, thank you very much for attending.